I thought, you know, I'll kick off with, with uh, the story of the book that we wrote, because we thought, and when I say we, it's my co-author, Yves Pinier, who used to be my PhD supervisor, we thought, you can't just write about business model innovation, you better do it as well. It gives you more credibility. So we created this book in a different way. And the basis of it is, actually, since we're here at the Science Gallery, is a doctoral dissertation on the topic of business models with this very <laughs> strange title, The Business Model Ontology, a Proposition in a Design Science Approach. Okay? So that gives you a doctoral title, but you don't really know what's behind it. So when we decided to write the book, we tried to make it much more approachable. But when we started out with the book, you know, I thought, naive as I am, I thought, our ideas are pretty valuable. We want to bring them to the world. We want to turn this into a bestseller, something that people all around the world know about. Right? And now, why is that a naive idea? So I'll give you some industry context here. If you look at the publishing industry, every year there are one million English books coming out. Of those one million books, 11,000 are business books. So talking about a competitive industry, Every year, 11,000 business books come out. So you can guess, I mean, nobody was waiting for 11,001. Nobody was waiting for our book. Nobody. And it's even worse than that. It's actually an industry that's in decline. 12% of book sales, at least in, in physical channels, are disappearing. It just goes up in smoke. Okay? And here comes this former PhD student who thinks he can write a management bestseller, this competitive environment in the shrinking market. So what did we do? We thought we'll do things differently. And the first thing we did is we changed the product. We thought, let's write a different kind of management book. Let's write one where design plays an important role, not to make the product beautiful, not to put lipstick on the pig, but because visual thinking is pretty important when it comes to business. Visual thinking allows you to simplify complex topics. It allows you to convey messages quicker. So this is how the book looks. I'm not trying to pimp the book or sell the book here. <laughs> but we hired a designer who was working on this, Alan Smith, for about seven months, which makes the whole product to make much more expensive, but it makes it more accessible. And one of the biggest successes for us was that, for many people, this was their first business book. So architects, designers said, hey, I've never read a business book. This is my first business book. Because we try to make it in a different way, it's more approachable, more accessible, and, and brings the message across. Now, the question is, would a publishing company, the traditional publishing house, would they do something like that? What do you think? There's no chance because it's expensive to produce and they don't know if it's actually going to sell, particularly if you have two European authors, because the big publishing houses are all American, or most of them, and they don't like European authors, particularly if they're not you know, one of the well-known business schools. So we also changed the business model. And what we did differently, we said, let's co-create, because actually there were already people around the world who were using the approach, because I put the PhD dissertation online, we said, let's get practitioners involved. And how strange is that? Somebody who writes a management book and gets practitioners involved. But we did something even more special. We thought, you know, let's ask people to pay to join us and to help us write the book. So imagine you maybe never heard of me before and I say, hey, I want to write a management bestseller. This is your opportunity. You can join. You'll have your name in the book. But you know what? You have to pay me $24. Can I have your credit card information, please? <laughs> Over the web. <laughs> Actually, people signed up very quickly. So we thought, hey, this is going to get out of hand. We want to keep the group small. So we raised the price 50%. People joined. We raised the price 50%. People joined. We raised the price 50%. The more we raised the price, I think the more attractive it, it became to join because you're part of an exclusive community. And three days before sending the book to the printer, because we self-published, we asked for 
and still three Americans joined, right? They wanted their name in the book. So that's pretty interesting. And then the result actually is really interesting is because we got people to join, we had ambassadors for our book. People from 470 people from 45 countries were helping with this and they promoted it all around the world because they had their name in it, because they participated, because they felt part of this process. So my proudest result is actually this, <laughs> right? Spread all the way to the Zulu nation. Now, let me get started with business models, the topic of business models. And I want to take you back in time. I want to take you back to 1958. So I'm going to take you into a Swiss invention. It's the time machine. We invented the time machine. So you have a lot of interesting things here at the science gallery, but I'm sure you don't have the time machine. So I'm going to take you back to 1958. And I'm going to present you to a person who I learned about through Henry Chesbrough, a professor in Berkeley at, at the business school there. Now, this is a guy called Chester Carlson. Anybody ever heard of Chester Carlson? Okay. You, you know what he did? <laughs> exactly. He's actually a lawyer <laughs> who, who became tired of being a lawyer. He went into research, and he was the head of a research team at a company called Halloid, and they invented the first modern-day photocopying machine. Now, this machine could make 2,000 copies a day at a time where you could make 15 to 30. So it was a huge technological jump, right? Problem was, is that it costed seven to eight times more. So they didn't know really what to do with it. So they went to the consultants and they asked them, it's a company called Arthur D. Little, what, what they should do. So the consultants went out, did their market research, they came back and they presented the results and the recommendations. What do you think Arthur D. Little told Halloween, this company who invented the technology? What would your guess be? It's too expensive? Lease it? So you know the model how it is today. But in 1958, you don't know what to do with something like this. So they said, there's no use for it. Put it away. Get rid of it. They didn't, they didn't listen. Okay? They didn't listen to the consultants. And that's not the, the lesson here. The lesson is actually that they went back to the drawing board and they came up with a different business model. They came up with the model of leasing, but that's just part of it. So they said, they told companies, you can lease this technology for $95 a month and you'll get 2,000 copies per month for free. But if you make more copies, you have to pay a couple of cents per copy. So what happened is, these companies jumped on, on the offer because it was relatively cheap. And the people in the companies, they started make it, making 2,000 copies a day, which means from day two onwards, Halloween, which became Xerox, started earning on the photocopies. And because of the volume of that, they had huge growth rates and they, they earned a lot of money over time. And they defined the business model in this industry, right? So let's look at another example. Let's go to 1997. And I'll introduce you to two people who you are probably more familiar, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. They popularized the first modern day search engine, right? Now they had a different problem. Their product was not too cheap, uh, too, too expensive, it was too cheap, right? It was free. How do you make money from free? Can you make money from free? Well, I guess Google proved us how you can make money from free. Still, 95% of their revenues come from advertising that they can sell because they offer free search. And most interesting is they auction off the search terms, okay? So, if you look at those two examples, what do they have in common? Two examples, what's similar between them? What do you think? They changed the model? Did they change an existing model? They actually invented a model, right? What else? It's out of the box thinking. They came up with something totally new. N nobody imagined that until then. I'll give you three points. The first one, so they didn't just focus on the product, okay? not just on the technology. So technology innovation is great, product innovation is great, but in these two cases, it was not enough. 
Now, many of us who are in companies in startups or in large organizations, who's in a large organization? Let's say 1,000, 5,000 or more. Who's in a startup? Okay. We often focus on products or technology. But in these two cases, they focused on something larger, the business model. Second point is, they invented a new model. Now, one of the things in business that we do often is look at the competition first, right? We always benchmark, and they invented new models. Now, how good are we at inventing new stuff? Well, it turns out we're not really good at it. And the third one is, they had to take some risks and experiment. And in many organizations, we're afraid of experimenting. We don't play to find out new things anymore. So, three points, and that's going to be what I'm going to be talking about the rest of the uh, 40, 50 minutes that we have together. Business models the attitude that's required to come up with new business models, new ideas. And the third point is, can you actually test these risky ideas before you build them, before you start spending a lot of money? Turns out you can't. So let's start with the first one. And I want to get you to work in what I call a buzz group. I want you to discuss one question with your seat neighbor. Okay, so. Just briefly, in groups of two, I want you to discuss what is a business model? What do you understand under this term business model? What is a business model? Okay, let's go, one minute discussion, what's a business model? Okay, let's do this together. Who, who has an idea what a business model is? Who's never used the word business model? Never ever in their whole life. I don't believe you. <laughs> I believe the person in the back. You're, you're the eighth person in the world that, that has never used the term. Um, who, who can tell me what a business model is? It's not a trap question, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Oops. There you go. What's a business model? I think it's how to make money. Okay, how to make money. That's it. That's it. Fine. Okay. Yep. I think it's about looking who benefits from the product and who pays your check. Okay, so we have a bit more. Yeah? Yeah. Did you say? You the used vehicle to bring to, value. Okay, the vehicle to, to bring value. Okay, perfect. Do we have another one maybe, a different one? Anybody have a different definition? In a profitable way, adding something, yeah? Okay, so we had a couple more elements. Everybody had a slightly different definition. Let's keep it with this for a moment. Right? Everybody had a slightly different take on this. Who Googled it or, or went to Wikipedia? <laughs> There's always some people who, who, who cheat. <laughs> no, there's no cheating here, but... I mean, there's no natural science behind what a business model is or not, but what's interesting is behind a term that many of us use every now and then or more or less often, you know, there's, there's no shared definition. Everybody speaks about something else. You have this idea of the Tower of Babel. You know the story, you know? <laughs> the people wanted to build a tower that goes all the way to God, and then God came down and created languages so people couldn't communicate anymore. Well, I ask this question everywhere in the world. What is a business model? And you get usually as many definitions as people in the room. So basically for this word, that we think we understand, everybody has a different mental model. So different understanding up here of what a business model is. Now, that's not tragic, but what's annoying is when you get a group of people together, and then, you know, let's say it's a startup and somebody says, we need to find our business model, or it's a large company where the boss, the, the CEO says, we need to reinvent our business model. This is how the discussion is gonna look. Blah, 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 blah. And this is what you're gonna get. It's not because people are not smart, but it's because we're not very careful how we discuss this topic, which means we're not going to be very good in coming up with new business models. This is a, a book that's coming out this month, actually just came out, I think. A friend of mine, Dan Rome, who wrote also Back of the Napkin, he shows that very often when we just use words, our communication is not very good. So I'd like to use 
slightly different approach of discussing business models, a, a, more of a visual approach. And this was actually the initial goal of my doctoral dissertation, years back now, to create a shared language to discuss business models. So we came up with something that we now call business model canvas. So you can see this fancy word ontology disappeared. <laughs> Nobody know, really knows what it means. Everybody knows what a canvas means, right? What do you do on a canvas? You paint. So you can paint an existing landscape or an imaginary landscape. Same with business models. You can paint out your existing business model, make it tangible, discuss it, or you can paint out a new business model, and by painting it out, you make it tangible and it's easier to discuss. So, let me see. Actually, I wanted to do something with sound. I don't know if this is going to work. So this, this business model canvas is just a simple language to describe challenge design and invent business models. And I still haven't told you what my version of, is of what a business model is. So I'll show you a little movie that outlines this. If we can get the sound to work. Yep, perfect. And it's all about nine building blocks to describe a business model. And we'll work with that after seeing an example. An organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks. Your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the business model canvas, a tool that helps you map, discuss, design, and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. The channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. Customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. The revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. Key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. Then once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives. So I, I use the video now to explain it because the video is not as chatty as I am. I always run over time if I try to explain it. So nine basic building blocks. And if we can distribute the canvases now, that'd be great. So you're going to get this one now, which is designed for poster format. So you can't read everything there. But once you have this, you can start sketching out your business model. Hey, who are my customers? What am I offering them? How am I reaching them? Through which channels? How am I earning money? And how am I doing all this? So it's pretty easy, pretty straightforward, very simple. But the interesting thing here is you have the entire business logic on one page. Now, often we focus either on product and services or just on channels or customer segmentation, this fancy word that we use a lot, or revenue streams. Here you have everything on one picture. Now, why is that important? Because more and more companies are innovating in this big picture, not just in the individual pieces, but in the big picture. So let me give you an example, and then I want you to use this afterwards. So the example I'm going to start with, you'll see why I use this example afterwards, is in the coffee business. So we're going to look at coffee. Okay, Some of you look like you need a little bit of espresso now. <laughs> so it's a commodities business. Okay. 
Now, question to you, I'll use Switzerland because I know the data there. How much do you think did the, did the price we pay for coffee consumed at home, how much did that change over the last couple of years? What do you think? It's a commodities business. There's never been more coffee growers in the world ever. Do we pay 20% less, 20% more? More. Who says less? Who says less? Okay, very few. Who says more? Most of you. Okay, how much more? What would your guess be? 10%? 50%? Wow. More than 50? Anybody more than 50? Three? 300 times. 300%. Wow. In a commodities business. Okay? Close. <laughs> It's 600 to 800% more. And I can guarantee you, the Swiss do not throw money out of the window. That's why we have these big banks, right? <laughs> now, it's not George Clooney either. It's what George Clooney stands for in most of the world, is Nespresso. So Nespresso is a company who gets a Swiss and more and more people from around the world, France, Japan, Ireland as well, more and more in the US, they get us to pay six to eight times more. Now the question is, how do they do that? What did they do specifically? So at the heart of it is a product innovation. You have these machines. Who's ever, who's ever had a, an espresso coffee? Right? Pretty good, isn't it? Okay, I need to promote Swiss products a little bit here, right? <laughs> okay. at, the, at the center you have a machine, pretty well designed, and pods, aluminium pods with espresso inside, you put the, with coffee inside, you put the Hot in the machine, you press in a, bu a button, and out comes a very good espresso. One that you could imagine is like in the espresso bar in Milano, where you get the crema on top and everything. It's not just this black, disgusting brew. It's really a good espresso, right? Now, the results are pretty astonishing. Still, after years of existence, it's still one of the fastest growing businesses in Nestlé, the Swiss food empire, biggest food group in the world, has an average growth rate of 30%. Pretty good. When I showed this at Google, they just looked at me and said, yeah, <laughs> not so bad. But it's pretty good, particularly for most large companies. And it, it means with one product line, approximately 3.2 billion US dollars in, in, in revenues, right? Now, question is, is it just the machine, or is it more than that? Now, if we had more time, I'd get you to, to discuss this a bit, guess, guess a little bit, but I'll show you the example, and then I want you to work with this tool a little bit. So, basically what they did is, they said, hey, the Nespresso machines, we're going to sell them through retailers in different countries to households and businesses. We're going to earn money from a one-time machine sale. So here are the revenue streams, and the partners here are the machine manufacturers because making machines is not their core business. So they try to spread the machines through retail. But when it comes to pods, they have a different strategy. They say, hey, the pods, we're only going to sell them through our own channels, mail order, call center, then Nespresso.com, more and more Nespresso stores. You probably have one in, in Dublin as well, I'd guess. Okay, Same customer segments. But it also means they have to build these new channels, which is pretty costly. Why would they do that? Why do they make a difference between the machines and the pods? Anybody have a clue? What do you think? Why would they make a difference? Brand, OK, they can manage the brand in a different way. Okay. So you said you need coffee all the time. Why? Because that's true. <laughs> But it's also that you can use the pods only with this machine. So once you have the machine, you're trapped. Okay? So they try to push the machine to the largest you know, channel possible, which is retail, existing everywhere. Once you have the machine, you're trapped. You're locked in. So they don't need retail anymore because there's nowhere else you can go buy them, right? And once you have the machine, you need to buy Nespresso pods. So you might as well do it with them. Okay? which means that they make a huge amount of money on the repetitive sales of their pods. And once you buy from there, you're in their club. Okay? Now, what do they need? What do you think in terms of key resources and key activities to actually do that? What would you think do they need over here to do what they have over here? I already said they need the channels. What else do they need? Some simple things. 
Patents, right? Okay, what else? Why patents? Why do they need to protect their intellectual property? To protect the machine. To protect the machine. Otherwise, everybody else would make those pods, and then the margins would go down the drain, right? So patents are one of the most important parts of this business model. But then they need coffee, they need a brand, right? So they have a couple of resources here. Patents, the brand name that they needed to build up, and then obviously the coffee, straightforward. But then also production facilities for the pods. Nespresso makes 8 billion pods a year. 8 billion, okay? Wow. In terms of key activities, go quickly here. Business to consumer distribution. It's the first time this large company, Nestle, started selling directly to individual households. They used to sell large pallets to retailers. Then marketing, production, and then in terms of costs, you have production, business to consumer distribution, and marketing because George Clooney doesn't come cheap, right? So that's one business model on one page. Pretty simple, not difficult to understand. What's interesting here is that they did it in a different way. They invented a new way to sell coffee. So what I want you to do now is to do that for the organizations you work for. It doesn't matter if you're a student or if you're in the public sector, you all have a business model. But first I want to tell you why I chose Nespresso. Yes, they have an interesting business model, but there's another point to it. The first business model that they tried out, the first thing that they tried with the same machine, the first thing that they tried almost failed. They almost went bankrupt. Okay? They had a business model that looked like this. They would sell the same Nespresso system in a joint venture, a partnership with machine manufacturers. And they would sell in a specific way. They would sell through the sales force of the machine manufacturers to offices. Right? So you can see the system is very different from what we've seen before. The business model is very different. This didn't work. Offices were not interested. And the sales force was not interested in selling this silly machine. Because these are real men. They sell big machines, right? Big coffee machines. So this didn't work. Now what does that mean? It actually means that the difference between success and failure can be the business model even with the best product. Now, what's interesting with Nestle is that they went on to create new machines. Here are one that's called Dolce Gusto, which is focused on cappuccino. So some of us in here are cappuccino drinkers and some of us are espresso drinkers. You'd say, hey, this is similar technology. Probably the same business model. Well, no, they, they decided to sell with a different business model here because they understand that the business model has a huge impact on failure and success. Well, now, my favorite one, which unfortunately I didn't have when I became a father, <laughs> is the baby nest machine. So for all of you in here, some of you look like you're young and you're going to have children once, this is going to turn you into a perfect husband and father because you take a pod, you put it in the machine, you press a button, and in 30 seconds you have a bottle. And, and I promise you, at 5 in the morning, you know, you know the difference between 30 seconds and, and 10 minutes. I promise you. Okay? And you'll be the best father and the best husband in the world. So, now you all have a canvas. Now I want you to work again in groups of two. And what I want you to do is to sketch out each other's business model. So one of you, um, what's your name? Leah. Leah. Your name? Amy. Leah and Amy. Okay, so Leah is the understander, the interviewer. And Leah's role is to understand Amy's business model. So what is Leah going to do? She's going to ask questions. What are your customer segments? And then you're going to, can I just use this for a second? We have sticky notes. Anybody have sticky notes? Okay. So Leah is going to start. Oh, yeah, we have the studies. This is even better. Make sure that you just grab one and not two. They're very fine. So you start sketching out Amy's business model. Every element is a different post-it note. So if you have different customer segments, a different post-it note. If you have different channels, like I showed you before with Nespresso, different post-it note. Now. It's a crime to write on the canvas, okay? 
It's a crime punished by Irish law, I promise you. But why is this interesting to use different studies here? Because you can start moving around because Amy might make up her mind and say, oh, that's actually not an important customer. But then also, once you have your business model mapped out, you can start playing and saying, hey, what if I took away this channel? Would that reduce my costs? What if I you know, decided to have a new revenue stream? So you can start playing. So I'll give you eight minutes to sketch out um, your, your discussion partner's business model. Let's go, eight minutes. Let's continue together. I just want you to start working with this. Pretty simple tool, right? And I've, I've seen it being applied in the public sector and not-for-profit sector, social enterprises, social entrepreneurship, and in large companies like G and Procter and Gamble as well. So it's a pretty simple, straightforward tool. And they're actually, the person who edited the first book, Tim Clark, is now writing a book called Business Model U which is about making a business model for yourself. It's interesting. Now, what's the advantage of using a tool like this? And this goes for other similar tools, is that you actually go beyond the blah, blah, blah towards something where because you're using a visual external artifact, you're starting to negotiate what you put up. If you put up a post-it note or hear a study, you actually get to a consensus and everybody will be clear about what you're talking about. So I saw people using the studies. Be careful that you use just one sheet, because otherwise they don't work. They're electrostatic, so it only, only works when you use one. So I saw a couple of you used four or five at a time. Okay. Now, how do you come up with interesting business models? I want to quickly go into this. And I think what we need to do more is work like architects, work more like designers. So work more like architects. So this was the second part about design thinking. Work more like architects like Frank Gehry. Anybody know one of the iconic buildings of Frank Gehry? What did he do? Different. Okay. Bilbao Guggenheim Museum is the one we know best in Europe, right? So Frank Gehry was brought in by the mayor of Bilbao who said, hey, we have one of the ugliest cities in the world and we want you and your team to transform our city. So pretty big task, right? Now, you think it's heavenly inspiration, intuition, you know, raining, creative genius raining down on Frank Gehry and his team? Of course not. It's actually a pretty structured creative process. And one of the things that they use a lot are prototypes. They prototype a lot, they sketch a lot, before they choose a specific direction that they will go towards. So they will say, you know, they will take like this, and they will say, you know, do you like this prototype? Does this work for you? It was more like this, right? More like this? Okay. Then three days later, he's going to come back, and, and we just agreed on this. Three days later, he's going to come back and say, what about this? What do you think he's going to say? Well, that's not what I wanted. Oh, you don't like it? Why is it that you don't like it? What are the things that don't work for you? He will explore with his team different alternatives before actually choosing a direction, before deciding on what they're going to do. Now, that's something we don't do very often in business. We execute very quickly. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for business models? Well, it's the same thing. Rather than falling in love with your first idea, what you really want to do is explore other possibilities. What if I gave away my product for free? What if I sold it for a million dollars? What if I got customers to do all the work? Right, IKEA. What if I built a platform around my product? What if I did a partnership with my biggest competitors? So by exploring different possible business models, you're going to develop better ones. You're going to come to better solutions. That's something you learn in design school. You learn how to throw away good and bad ideas before you decide on what you're going to do. You learn that at design school. That's what's taught to us. Who's, who's gone through a design education in this room, right? That's what's taught. In business, we're never taught to do that, but we're supposed to create new business models, new strategies. So we're not very good at it. So let's try to at least you know, 
do that for a simple example. Think up different alternatives. And the case I'm going to do is one that I'm in love with at the moment. It's about tackling a really big issue in the world. How does that sound at 7 in the evening? Want to tackle a really big issue? Okay. So we're going to look at this. We're going to look at access to proper sanitation, or actually the lack of access to proper sanitation. So 2.6 billion people don't have access to proper sanitation. I don't, want to feel, I don't want you to feel bad this evening, that's why we're going to work on it a bit. Find a solution of how, four, how those four out of ten people who don't have access to proper sanitation, how they could get it. And there's a Swedish company, a Swedish startup working on it, and they have a product called, very concrete name, called the Peepoo Bag, and the company's called Peepoo Poo. Okay, this is not a joke. They really think they're onto something here. And the product, it's pretty straightforward. It's a single-use toilet bag that you can use with any recipient that you have around you. Now, product's amazing. It's a single-use toilet bag. It's self-sanitizing, biodegradable, turns into fertilizer, and they think it works really well in this context of, you know, most of those 2.6 billion people are uh, poor people, to, to actually bring it to them. They need low production costs. What's interesting to know is that there's actually already a market there. Because even though those 2.6 billion people have very low purchasing power, they already spend on public latrines. So they're already paying. Now, people thought, you know, we could do it with the traditional charity model, but that doesn't work. It's not sustainable. They're trying to figure out, and they're trying some things now, they're testing some prototype business models because the product works. Trying to figure out what could the right business model be to build a profitable business and one that can scale. So I want you to work on this for a minute with your seat neighbor. Come up with some ideas for this product. How could they build a profitable and scalable business model? You don't need to sketch it out on the canvas, just some brainstorming for a minute. What would possible business models be for this product? Let's go, one minute, possible business models. Be creative here. Okay, let's see what you came up with. Any ideas? Any ideas? What did you come up with? What could people do? What could they do? Any, any possible business model ideas here? Yeah, over there? Okay, so they could sell it to the Red Cross. They could sell it to the Red Cross, okay? Yeah. Yeah, whoops. Partner with a fertilizer company. Okay, so they could sell the fertilizer. Yep. Um, partnering up with, um, say, Coca-Cola or something like that, through vending machines. Right, in and out, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, over there? Yeah, or here first, yeah? free absolutely you okay could, um, distribute the bag like as a, a general carrier bag so for carrying home things and okay then use it or right you could, or you could sell the shite because people buy shit <laughs> <laughs> that is true yeah over here yeah there. I think your primary target would be mums because the biggest concern is around young children so maybe you could partner with community community healthcare nurses or right. um, hospitals or clinics right okay so I just wanted you to get a feel for this idea that one product can lead to many different possible business models. And it's not clear which one is going to work, which one isn't going to work. And you better take some time to figure out which one could work, which one could be the best one. It's the same theme as we've seen with Nespresso. So this is exactly what people is, is, is doing at the moment. They're testing different business models, just like you would test a product. Okay, so let's look at this for a second. Testing business models before you build them. Now, anybody ever seen this product here? It's called Flow TV. Okay, it's a device that allows you to watch, or it allowed you to watch TV anywhere in the US. But they closed down Flow TV. And the company behind it is a company called Qualcomm. How much money do you think they lost on building this? What would your guess be? How much can you lose on something like this? Millions, right? Not billions, but close to that. Eight hundred million dollars. Okay, that's not bad. 
And <laughs> Right. What am I showing you? This is peanuts, right? <laughs> you, do, you do much better. <laughs> now, <laughs> what, what should they do? To, what should they have done to avoid this? Now, what you really want to do is when you look at a business model that looks excellent on paper, with the smartest people in the room, with the best market research, you still need to admit one thing. And this is why business plans are nonsense. Because business plans are worth nothing. Because basically, it still is all just a series of guesses or hypotheses. Until you test it. Test the business model. So how do you do that? Well, I learned about that. So when we wrote the book, we thought about designing business models and implementing business models. And we focused on the first part in the book. What I learned later on from a guy called Steve Blank, um, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley um, entrepreneur, retired now because he successfully sold his last company, now teaching at Stanford, Berkeley, and Columbia. Well, he shows that you can test business models before you build them, before you hire a sales force, before you do this and that, that burns a lot of cash. And his basic theory is, well, when you have that paper with those guesses, you need to get out of the building and start testing with customers, with partners with channel partners, if this could really work before you build it. And with Flow TV, I'm pretty sure they didn't do that, right? So how does this look? Well, oops, took one away. You start with the business model that you designed. You ask yourself, what are the most important guesses there that you're making? And then you go out in the field and test it, right? Now, I want to show you last, one last thing before we get to the questions. And let's see if the technology works here. So, whoops, Gee, so many cables, I'm totally lost. We created one thing that we thought would be pretty interesting. What's missing? So, talking about business models, there's one thing we didn't look at. What's missing painfully here? For Who who's considers themselves as a business person in the room? Okay. What's painfully missing from my presentation? Money, <laughs> numbers, right? Okay, so we thought, you know, we believe in business model prototyping. What if we made an iPad app that it would, would allow anybody to start prototyping business models? Not just on paper with post-it notes, that's pretty fun. But if we did that, just like you would do it in a spreadsheet, but much quicker. Now here's where I have no clue if the technology is gonna work. Ta-da, see, wow, cool. So I'll quickly do this in two minutes for this app. So we created an app to sketch out business models. So let me design a, a business model for this app. So I'll take here a value proposition. What am I trying to sell? Let's say, okay, we're selling an app here. Let's close the hints, let's close the colors. Our value proposition is an app. And we want to sell it to Irish entrepreneurs and Irish consultants. Okay? How do you sell an app for the iPad? App Store, right? You don't have a choice. Apple forces you to sell through the App Store. So we're selling an app here, app sales. So I could do the same thing that you did on paper. But look at the left-hand corner there, if I, on the top. If I put on the calculator here, I can start guessing. Let's say, how many entrepreneurs in Ireland could be interested in this? Let's say 30,000. How many consultants? Let's say 30,000. And now, I choose a revenue stream. So I'm going to sell this app, this app here, to entrepreneurs. But in fact, when you sell through the App Store, what do you have to do? You have to pay Apple. 30% of your sales. So it's basically a sales minus the transaction cut. So I'm selling here minus the transaction cut to entrepreneurs. How many customers can I reach? 50% of those 30,000 that I said. How, much do they, how many times do they buy? Once. Um, how much do they pay? $29. What's the commission? 30%. So boom, I can see immediately, oh, 130,000 is what I earn, 40,000 is what I pay to Apple. That's not going to work. This app costs more to develop. So now I need to play with my business model because my first assumption didn't work. So what if I say I'm going to do a web app? Okay, 
Then I don't need to sell through Apple. Then I can sell through the web. So I'm going to do that for consultants. Let me change the color here. And if I sell through the web to consultants who can use this for years and for months to make more business, I could sell a subscription rather than just selling once. So let me choose a different revenue stream type here for the web app for consultants. Let me use the same numbers, 15% market share. How much are they going to pay? $9 per month. And immediately I can see, wow, the difference here in terms of dynamics is huge. So we can sit down around a beer, and in 15 minutes, we can just do a sanity test of an idea by throwing up a couple of post-it notes and a couple of numbers without ever opening a laptop and a spreadsheet, right? So I think this idea of playing with business model is going to become extremely simple and extremely accessible to anybody. Not necessarily those who consider themselves a business person, but anybody who has an idea and wants to make something out of that idea. So that's one of the things that we're trying to achieve. I'll stop here so I'm more or less in time, okay? Thanks. Great. Well done. Thanks, everybody. So, did you enjoy that? Yes. Did you find that really useful? Yes. How many people were rel relieved to hear that business plans are rubbish? <laughs> <laughs> How many people here have tried to write a business plan? It's not easy, is it? Um, do you think that that's the kind of thing that would help you do that? Yeah? yeah? Okay. I'm just going to uh, ask Alex a few questions and then throw it uh, to you guys. Um, Alex, very interesting. Thank you so much for all that. Um, I think that um, one thing that a lot of people might wonder is how often should you change your business model? Because in Ireland, obviously, we're in economic difficulty at the moment, and some business models that were working during the boom right. are no longer working. Right. So what do you think? I think the what we're going to see more and more is that changing the business model, innovating the business model is not going to be a stunt anymore. We're not going to say, oh, we need to change our business model, but it's going to become a common practice where we do it all the time. We always assess our business model and see how long is you know, the, the shelf life of this. And w what's important is actually while you're successful, that you already experiment with new business models. You might have heard of Clayton Christensen, this whole idea of disruptive innovation. Well, it turns out that if you don't innovate while you're successful, there's a big risk that you're going to get disrupted by somebody else. Because if you just focus on your success and the most you know, profitable clients, well, maybe somebody is going to innovate at the periphery and undermine your existing business model. So what you want to do, and we're seeing this in some companies now, is that while you're successful, you need to play with the portfolio of new business models. So I think this habit of playing around with your business model, looking at business models in different industries, that's really important because you can learn from that and importing them into your business, that's, beginner, that's gonna become normal business. So I think we need to do this more. Um, Google seems to be one of the companies that does that a lot. And in fact, they encourage their employees, don't they, to go off and think of new ideas and new business models. So they're very aggressive in that space. But what about older, more established companies that might not have that thinking internally and then might be quite set in their old yeah. business model? How do you disrupt that? So I think, oops, I think this one turned off. Actually, Google is, is an example of how you don't do business model innovation because they innovate a lot, but they do technology innovation. They do product innovation. That's very different from what Apple does in terms of business model innovation. So I think Google is amazing in the sense that they have this innovation culture, but they haven't understood business model innovation yet because 95% of their revenues come from the same thing since they started out. It's advertising. So the type of innovations that they're doing now in mobile with Android and, and so on, that's all to sustain the existing business model, which is fine because they're making a lot of money, right? Now, the other part of the question is how do established companies do this? That's tough. <laughs> it's easier for a startup because you start from a blank sheet, right? So you don't have, those of you in a startup, well, great. You can start to create whatever you want. In large companies, the big issue is that you're going to be competing for people, for budgets, for, for time, for management attention. To do that is pretty tough. So what large companies have to learn how to do is have a space where they execute 
And there they use the traditional mechanisms of budgeting and evaluating people on plans. And they need to, in parallel, start building laboratories of experimentation, not just of the technology uh, implementation, uh, ex experimentation, R&D, that we have that, right? But we don't have very many companies that are good at experimenting with business models, so-called business innovation departments, right? And, and that's what we, we need to start building because the logic there is very different. When you execute, you can make budgets and plans. You can actually make business plans when you know your customers and you know how it's going to turn out because you know the industry. When you don't know how the industry is or how the business model is going to work out, you can't make a business plan because it's going to change. So if you've spent three months writing a business plan, you can tear it up because... So Steve Blank, the guy who, who I talked about before, he says, your business plan is never going to survive the first contact with customers. So why write it, right? So you're better off to take a business model, make one, and try to figure out the best one, but then you know, accept that probably it's going to change. So you're going to have to iterate or pivot, how they say in Silicon Valley now, <laughs> pivot through business models. That's easier to do as a startup than in a large company. But we're learning there, I think, as well. Um, and I'd like to open it up to the audience now. Anybody there have any questions for Alex? Yes, um, somebody can just get a microphone here, please. Thank you. They're getting their workout now this evening, running <laughs> up and down the stairs. Um, what are the components you find yourself adding to the business model more often than not now? Because I know a lot of people do try to innovate with the canvas itself, and especially coming from a, a not-for-profit background, it's something that we have to do quite a bit when we're talking about agenda-driven initiatives and trying to reverse engineer a business model or with revenue streams. So do you right. find it happens a lot that you're adding other components to the nine-part canvas? To the nine blocks? Yeah. So, no. <laughs> but what, what's funny is I get, I get emails sometimes and questions from audiences where they say, you know, Alex, that's a pretty powerful approach, but you're, you're missing one building block. So they don't say many, they say one. And the one that comes up most often is there's no competition in there. You need to add the building block competition. So I say, fine, if that works for you, do it. But basically, we put the nine blocks there on which you decide on. So you decide which customers you're going to serve. You decide what you're offering them. You decide which resources and activities you're going to going to have, right? You don't decide on competition. That's part of the environment, of the context in which you design. So think of the analogy of an architect. When an architect designs a building, he's going to decide on the walls, on the room layouts, all those things. But he's going to design that building in a context with legal environment, land use, the people, how they're going to use the building, the specifications of the paying client, but that's all the design context. So it's the same for a business model. You decide on these nine blocks, but you take into account the context. Technology change can be an opportunity. Legal environment is a constraint. Um, competition is a threat, right? But you design within that context. So we've actually experienced very little, very few times that people said, we really want to change those nine building blocks. And I know it's something that you you've wrote a couple of blogs about, but the music industry seems to be somewhere that you, uh, you think that business model innovation is particularly pertinent. Is it something that, I mean, I suppose the, the iTunes and the interface that iTunes have built is, is maybe the best example of it, but do you think it's still an area that requires a, a large degree of, of innovation in their business models and how they approach customers? No, I, I think the music industry is just one where it's very visible. It's a playground of business models. So you have amazing models like Spotify, who are now a competition to iTunes. But I think the same thing is happening in more and more industries. So you can see it happening in the pharmaceutical industry. You can see it happening everywhere. So what's really interesting is that we have some that are ahead in terms of pressures to innovate and some that are following. I, mean, I think the pharmaceutical industry is an interesting one to follow because their business model has expired <laughs> and they need to change, right? So it's happening everywhere. Thanks, Alex. Okay, up here. Hi, sorry, Alex. Just in relation to risk management, would yep. you advise you know, people to think about risks as you're building the model or after the model has been built then? You know, work in an unencumbered uh, fashion and then think of the risks afterwards? No, so, so 
basically one thing that I didn't mention when we were talking about large organizations is they fear risk like hell. Right? And in a large organization, if you start taking risks, you're actually undermining your career because we hate failure in large organizations. So who's, who's ever <laughs> failed in a large organization? <laughs> it's the worst thing you can do, right? So that people try to avoid it. But the problem is here that failure is actually very good. Small failure, not the type of flow TV failure. Because when you experiment and fail, you learn. And you can use that learning to change, right? So it's the same thing for business models. Actually, the way you manage risk is by testing very early pieces of the business model all the time by failing and learning. And when you integrate that kind of quick failure, cheap failure, repetitive failure, you're going to succeed quicker and you're going to minimize your risk. So it's a paradox because the less you fail, the bigger the risk. The more you fail, the smaller the risk. So I think what big companies have to learn, that's why you need to create a separate space, is how to allow people to fail without punishing them. Because today in a large organization, you're punished if you fail. Because there's no way to actually not just allow people to fail, but to promote them to fail. Because that's how you learn. Here and then there. Okay. It's the nope. tyranny of the mic, right? <laughs> Whoever has the mic. <laughs> Um, how do you treat financials um, in a constant changing business model and in a constant changing strategy uh, environment? What do you mean with how do you, how do you... How do you, um, for example, how... In the classical business plan you have, for example, you have a strategy and then you get, uh, from those strategies you get um, some costs, uh, operational costs, mm -hmm. uh, and then you get to make a, a plan of the assets or whatever of the financials in several years. If you have a constantly changing business model, that means that few of your plans are changing. And then your costs and financial models uh, yeah. that you will follow are changing. How do so you relate that? So the, the one thing that we need to learn more, and this is really mainly for large organizations, is to manage a portfolio of business models where you have some that are making money, they're very successful, and while you're making money with those business models, that you experiment with other ones. And probably we're going to see more of a, a venture capitalist approach where in those business models that we're experimenting with, we know that some are going to fail, some are, are going to cost us money. But we also know that if we have, from, from a portfolio of 10, if we have two that succeed big, well, it's going to cover more than cover the cost of those eight that failed. So we're going to have to really work more with portfolios of business models to, to keep the, the, the finances in balance, the cash cows and, and those that are going to produce cash in the future. And that's, that's a difficult thing to do, indeed. I was going to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first one relates to the weighting of the blocks, because clearly the yep. weighting is, is key in, yep. in any sector and in industry. Yep. Second question was, for a business person, nine blocks sounds like a lot of blocks. You want two or three blocks, not nine yeah. blocks. Yeah. And the third point was, it, it, it's almost as if the theory, the, the, the teaching is more appropriate for a big company with a lot of people who's made a lot of money already yeah. and has the time to spend money on, on research and development. Yeah. Okay, so I don't remember all questions. You're going to repeat them again. But I remember the first, let's start with the first one. <laughs> I don't remember the one in the middle. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> Great. No, so uh, at the early stages when, when I started doing workshops around this concept, one designer in a, in a workshop said, you know what's interesting about this concept about the business model canvas is that conceptually all nine blocks have more or less an equal weight conceptually right now from one industry to another each block might have a different weight right? in some industries the right hand part of the canvas the distribution will be more important than the left hand part which is more about how you do it and in some industries the how will be more important right but conceptually, they're all pretty equal weight. And that's what we tried to achieve when we designed this canvas, to find nine blocks that are relatively similar 
in terms of conceptual weight, and we try to find all those nine important questions. Now, from one industry to another, they will be different. But what's interesting to observe is sometimes you'll see some crazy company or person who will take ideas from a different industry, say, hey, I'm going to take this, and he's going to change this <laughs> picture of weights where all of a sudden, oh, distribution channels, direct sales was less important in the Nespresso model. They will change the, the traditional configuration. So that's the first one. Then the second question was, was about um, the nine building blocks for, the, for business people. Yes, and that's a big problem. Because I think in most companies, this is for big companies and startups alike, we're very focused on products, segments, and then the financials, obviously, right? So three. That's a huge limitation. You could not sketch out a business model like Nespresso if you don't take the nine blocks because, you know, there were different elements there that were important for the success. So I think what we need to learn is to think more in terms of systems because that's where the innovation is going to happen. The, the innovation that gives you a long-term competitive advantage. I think the the ticket, <laughs> I always call this the journey, the competitive journey, the ticket that product innovation buys you flies you maybe from here to London. If you're good at business small innovation, you'll get he from here to Rio probably, right? And once everybody does business small innovation, probably we're going to have to think about something new, right? But I think it's limiting if we, if we just think about two or three blocks because we won't exploit the potential that we that we have today in terms of design choices when it comes to business models. And the third question, I don't remember. Anyway. The third question related to the ability to apply your theory or, or your teaching yeah. in, in a real business sense, which yeah. is where do you get the time, the effort, the money, yeah, uh, and the indulgence, if you like? Uh, uh, yeah. Don't you have to be a big, successful company to be able to adopt your ideas? So. The place where these ideas have taken off first was in startups because they wanted to figure out what is my business about. They used to write business plans, but it was not satisfying because business plans don't give you this one page view. So actually, there people started to do it very quickly. And if you take, you know, add Steve Blank's customer development testing business models to the mix, you get something very powerful that will help startups save money actually burn less cash because what do you do? You start to quickly sketch out a business model, use a, a thing like the business model toolbox on the iPad. I mean, that will take you 20 minutes to play around with an idea. But then what you do is you start going out of the building and you immediately test with customers. Could these channels work? Do these customers have the budget? You go back, you integrate the learning, and, you, and, and before you build something expensive like hiring a sales force or buy, building the product, you already saved a lot of money. So actually, it's, it's much more productive than the, the traditional approaches. So I, I think it's actually it, 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 it's, it's a better way to do things. Now, in large companies, when I show this slide with the architectural thinking and coming up with different models, I can already see in managers' eyes, you know, how am I going to you know, do that all the time it's going to require? But now, think of... I don't know, some of you have been in this situation where a team comes together, you, say, you do brainstorming, you pick an idea, and then the boss says, go for it. And you start executing, right? Pretty quickly, that's what, how we do things. <laughs> a bit black and white here, but that's how we do things often in companies. Then maybe two weeks later, somebody says, I think this might not work. And then they say, you know, the other team members say, well, now we can't turn around. We've already invested so much time and energy. So they will head into the wall with Flow TV and lose $800 million. So actually the time you spend up front prototyping is very valuable. So we do need to learn how to do that. Now what architects do very well and designers do very well is they make rough sketches. They won't try to find a solution. When they do their first sketch, it's going to take them a second, right? <laughs> but I can already test it with you. You know, do you like this building? I'll get feedback immediately. In business, we always think we need to find the perfect solution when we start thinking. An architect does not start with trying to find the perfect solution. He tries to fail to learn. He will explore different alternatives. See the difference?
It's quite, so if we, a, it's quite a scientific approach, really, since we're in the science it gallery. Is, it is. Because yeah. you think, well, maybe this is it, but then you test and you experiment to exactly. see whether yeah. your assumptions are correct. Right. Um, somebody uh, who works at the science gallery wanted me to ask you that question. Okay. So they were too shy to ask it themselves, but yeah. how do you think that that is part of the process that, or yeah. part of the problem is that businesses are thinking you know, on a one-dimensional level and they're not yeah. thinking in a scientific way about yeah. design? So I think the science analogy is interesting because it's about um, searching and trying to find and a rigorous method to do that. That's where you could say there's similarities. But there's a big difference as well. Is in science, you try to find theory where you can predict. So you're trying to find natural laws. Mm -hmm. I don't believe there are any natural laws when it comes to social science. So you will never be able to predict success. You can never say this business model is going to work because there are too many variables in the market. I mean, there are people, there are laws, there's the weather, right? There's the Irish debt, whatever. I mean, there are a lot of components, so you will never be able to predict like you can do in science. So in that sense, it's actually very different. It's, it's more, more complicated is maybe the wrong word, but you will never, I believe, you will never be able to predict and part of the problem today in management research is we're trying to find laws that allow us to predict, but you can't. I mean, that's it where, people. Yeah, where the black swan theory is pretty powerful because you might be able to predict part of it, but then a variable just goes crazy and the whole thing is broken again, right? Okay. Um, final question. Any final questions there in the audience? I haven't asked for this side, so. Can I? Um, I just want to ask Alex, you mentioned earlier on about business plans and uh, when you know your industry, you know your sector, you know your market, etc. A, a written full business plan probably makes sense as opposed to startups going into a new area that they don't have any experience and a business plan is, is rather useless. Is your canvas applicable to some of the more traditional sectors and industries, professional services? Um, moving into maybe new markets, uh, uh, can, it be, can it be applied? So, applying the canvas is, you, you do it on a continuum. One is existing business models, just by discussing with a tool like the canvas, you get a better discussion. So, even when the business model is normally known, we don't have very good discussions when it comes to the business model. So, just as a discussion tool, it allows you to improve the discussion around existing business models. The other side of the spectrum is you're trying out new business models in un, you know, unexplored spaces. There, you know, it's the same thing. It allows you to have a better discussion, but it will also allow you to make different prototypes of alternative possibilities, which you probably won't do in a known space with known business models. So if you break into an existing market with an existing business model, but you want to execute better, you can still sketch out that business model that you want to implement. I'm pretty sure you'll have a better implementation if you work and discuss in such a visual and tangible way. And this goes not just for the business model canvas. There are tons of tools like that that are becoming very popular. There's one book called Game Storming that has a whole series of tools like this. Right? So I think it's, it's becoming a, a more mainstream approach to discussing business issues. The interesting thing here is, <laughs> that the higher you get in the hierarchy of a company, look at the meeting rooms, look at how they look. I mean, you know, what are the things there? Do you have whiteboards at the very highest level of, of a company in the meeting rooms? No, you have paintings of the founders and the former chairman. So how are you going to put up post-it notes, right? On the heads of the founders? Or... So actually, it's as if the, the, the problems we're discussing would get easier the higher we get up. You know, easier in the sense that, oh, we don't need visual thinking anymore to simplify the problems. So, I think that's something we need to do more, is use these tools at the very highest level where we have very you know, serious discussions about complex issues. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending the Open Mind series. Thanks again to the sponsors, McCann Fitzgerald, from the Science Gallery, and Trinity College. And we hope that you'll be back at the next one, and also that you will have a look at some of the exhibitions, if not today, then another time. And thank you so much for your support. We'll have a book signing now, and there's um, a special deal on the book. And uh, so you're welcome to come up and um, ask Alex for his signature. Thank you very much, Alex. Really enjoyed it.